That felt so powerful, you know. <laughs> We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 this morning. We're going to look at Genesis 1, 26 to 27. So if you would turn there in your Bibles or pull it up on your phones if Google will let you. Starting with verse 26, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the, the birds of the air, and over the cattle which roam the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female. Then God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We have a tradition in our home. When you graduate high school, dad does not buy you a car, especially a Prius. But dad will take you on a trip. That's what frequent flyer miles are for. And when my son Jeff graduated high school, there was no question where we were going. I didn't even need to ask him. We were going to go to the beaches of Normandy, France, where the historical events around D-Day happened. He's a history buff like his dad, and he said, I want to go stand where our guys were on June 6, 1944. And if you know your history, you know that the first wave of Army Rangers that hit the beach on June 6 sustained 80% casualties. And if you saw the movie Saving Private Ryan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The problems were a couple of things. The first was this. The tide charts had been all wrong. Our guys were told they were going to jump off landing crafts into water that was maybe shoulder depth. No, they were jumping into water 30 feet deep, and they're carrying 100 pounds of weaponry, and many of them go straight to the bottom and drown before they even get a shot off. Those who don't drown men and women only live by ditching their weaponry, but now they have a problem. They've got to run across the beach unarmed while they're taking fire from the sides and in front. And if you, again, saw the few, first few moments of Saving Private Ryan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The carnage was terrible. And as you're standing there in that American cemetery looking at all those white crosses, it is an amazing place to be as an American citizen. And uh, Jeff said to me, hey, Dad, let's do something. Let's go down to the beach. Let's wade out into the water and walk back toward the land the way our guys would have on D-Day. We're standing out there in the water, and we're just having this great father-son moment, overwhelmed by the sense of gratitude for our men who did this. And the French tour guide was yelling at us in French, come on, come on, you're holding up the whole group. I'm like, hey, babe, we saved your butts in this war. We're staying right here. We're going to enjoy this father-son moment. And uh, as I was standing there, though, I was struck by this thought. What would it feel like to be confronted on a hostile beach with a very well-fortified foe and not have what you need to engage? And tonight, or today, I want to talk about this topic. How can we as Christians biblically engage on hostile turf on an issue like abortion so that we don't offend people, but we defend our view with grace and truth? And that's what I want to look at today, because I think that matters to a lot of you, because you may feel that since Roe v. Wade was overturned, you feel under fire, under attack, outgunned, you don't know what to do, and you're thinking, I'm way in over my head here, how can I possibly be someone who brings God glory on an issue like abortion? Today we're going to equip you to make that case for life persuasively and truthfully, so you can be an effective ambassador for Christ. And I have some good news for all of you. The reason why this matters is because all of us as, as Christians, we have heard this. Well, your belief, your Christianity is just blind faith. You just believe to believe. You have no evidence for it. And our culture indeed thinks that on an issue like abortion, our faith is simply a leap in the dark. We believe what we do in spite of evidence rather than because of evidence. But that's not the biblical view of faith. The biblical view of faith is not a blind leap in the dark. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because there's good evidence that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. And we don't believe in a vacuum. That's the secularist version of what faith means. Biblical faith is this, trust based on evidence. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the essence of things hoped for. 
the evidence of things unseen. Note that word evidence. So we're going to look at that. I mean, culturally, our culture thinks faith is blind. When I got on the plane in Edinburgh, Scotland to make my journey heading this way, uh, I did not jump on a plane with blind faith. I had faith it would get me here this morning, but it wasn't blind faith. I looked up in the cockpit. There's two guys there with thousands of hours of flying experience. I was on a reputable airline. Delta stands for don't expect luggage to arrive, but you will. <laughs> and as I got on that plane, um, I'm going to have a special reception for Delta employees after this service, if there are any. I'll bail you out on this, Pastor Carl. But that faith that I had, notice it was not blind. I had good reason to have faith. The historical record of the airline, the fact that flying is safer than driving. I know some of you find that unbelievable, but it is. You're not going to die on an airplane more than likely. The most dangerous part of your flight is the drive to the airport, right? And you're, you're not going to. It's safe. But again, not blind faith. It was trust based on evidence. And today we're going to look at how we can make a case for the pro-life view to a culture that thinks we have nothing reasonable to offer, that all we have is blind faith. No, we're going to give you the tools to engage today so you're not on a hostile beach, ill-equipped to defend what you believe. We're going to help you with that. And I have more good news for you. You don't have to have a PhD to be an effective ambassador for Jesus on the pro-life issue. In fact, my friend Greg Kolkel puts it real well. You know what our job is as Christians? It's not to close the, the sale on the spot. Too often we think, I'm not going to evangelize because I know that person won't fall on their knees and say the sinner's prayer in front of me. Can I enlighten you on something? You and I are powerless to save anyone. And if I were to ask you today, how many people have you led to the Lord? I already know the answer. How many people have you saved? I know the answer for you because I know the answer for me precisely zero. I'm incapable of saving anyone, and so are you. It's God who saves people. You know what God does? God takes people who are dead spiritually, as Ephesians 2 teaches us, and he makes them alive. I didn't make anybody alive. I couldn't save myself. I didn't wake up one morning and say, you know what, I'm going to become a Christian today because I'm just deciding personally I want to do that. No, the Bible says I was God's enemy. I was dead in my sin. And God, who's in the business of making dead people alive, made me alive the way he made you alive. That's how we become Christians. So it's not on you to close the sale. It's on you to be an effective ambassador, to do what my friend Greg Kokel says, put a pebble in their shoe. Have you ever had a pebble in your shoe when you're out hiking? It wears on you and wears on you until you deal with it. That's your job as a pro-life Christian. Give people something to think about. Put that pebble in their shoe so that they begin to consider what we're about. And it isn't on you to be the guy or gal who closes the sale. So you don't need a PhD in philosophy or ethics to know how to do this. You do need to be clear, though, on three questions we're going to look at today. Question number one, what is the unborn? You need to be clear on that. Question number two, you need to be clear on the question of what makes humans valuable. And question three, you need to be clear on what is our duty. If you have those three questions in tow, you'll be effective for Christ on this issue. And you will not be caught ill-equipped on that hostile beach. You can make a difference for life where God has placed you. So let's look at that first question. We need to answer the question, what is the unborn? And I'll tell you why that question matters, men and women. The entire debate over abortion starts with that question. Now, I may shock you to say this, but can we kill the unborn? You know what my answer is? Yes, we can. If, if what? If the unborn are not human. But you've got to answer the question, what is it, before you can answer the question, can I kill whatever that thing is? Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose you're in your kitchen one day after a meal, and you're cleaning up, you're washing the dishes, and your five-year-old son comes in behind you with your back turned and says to you, Mommy or Daddy or Grandpa or Grandma, can I kill this? Some of you are looking at me, and all cute little boys would never ask such a question. Allow me to enlighten you. This ring on my finger says I've been married to the most glorious woman in all of Christendom for 38 years. We have a son, 32. We have a son, 31. We have a son, 26. And we have a daughter, 22. I have personally heard the question, Daddy, can I kill this, more times than you can imagine, usually with his hands wrapped around his brother's neck while he's asking the question. <laughs> what would be the very first thing you would ask when you hear that little pipsqueak say, Daddy or Mommy, can I kill this? 
What is it? Cockroach, snail, do whatever you want with it, but don't show mom, don't show your sister. Neighbor kitty, whoa. Brother by the throat, call Pastor Carl immediately. <laughs> you would never in a billion years say, sure, son, have at it, till you answered the prior question, what has he got? We just solved the abortion issue. Look, I am vigorously pro-choice on women choosing their own husbands, choosing the careers they wish to pursue, choosing their health care providers, the cars they wish to drive, but I'm not pro-choice on intentionally killing an innocent human being. We shouldn't be allowed to do that. We've got to answer the question, what is the unborn, before we answer the question, can we kill them? And sadly, very few people today answer that question. In fact, they ignore it. They simply assume the unborn aren't human. Imagine the IRS knocking on your door and saying, when did you stop cheating on your, or when did you start cheating on your taxes? And you protest. You say, I don't cheat on my taxes. I never have. And they say, that's not what we asked you. When did you start cheating? And no matter what you said in protest, they simply assumed you were breaking the law. You would be visibly shaken by this. Well, a lot of people in our culture do the same thing about the unborn. They don't present an argument that the unborn aren't human. They simply assume the unborn aren't human. Let me ask you this. Would anybody you know talk about choice and who decides or trusting women to make their own personal decisions or a right to privacy if the issue were killing toddlers? Never. Why do they only argue that way with the unborn? Because they assume the unborn aren't human. But that needs to be argued for, not simply assumed. Well, I've raised the question. I won't assume anything. I'll answer it. What is the unborn? Here's what the science of embryology tells us that from the earliest stages of development, you were a distinct living and whole human being. Everybody hold your hand out like this for a moment. Give yourself a good pinch on the back of your hand. Uh, it, ladies, if your husband is not participating, grab skin cells off the back of his neck. Give yourself a good pinch. Congratulations, you just sent a couple of hundred somatic cells hurling to their deaths on the Bible in front of you. Now these cells individually all contain your entire DNA encoding. Did you just commit mass homicide? The answer is no, and here's why. These cells on the back of your hand are merely part of a larger human being, you. They are not distinct whole human beings the way you were at the embryonic stage, the way I was at the embryonic stage. These cells are part of a larger human being. You, at the embryo stage, were already a whole living member of the human family. Now, some people hear that, and I get it. They say, well, it's just hard for me to believe that something you can't even see without a microscope is a human being the way you and I are. And I get their point. They're right. It doesn't look like a human being. It doesn't look like a baby. But guess what? It is a human being at the earliest stages of development. And sometimes what we initially think about something is mistaken. Let me give you an example. Everybody in the room that's under the age of 40, I need to give you a historical fact. There was a time when we did not take pictures with our phones. We had devices called cameras. For those of you who have no idea what that is, a camera was a rectangular or a square device with a lens that would open up, light would come through, and record your picture on this stuff called film. Film was, pardon me, I just went through puberty. <clears throat> film was expensive. We did not waste it taking pictures of our food. Um, if you're a dude, please listen to me. If you're a dude and you take pictures of dainty little portions on a nice little plate, I defriend you on social media. It better be a steak, a rack of ribs, or an In-N-Out burger. We're just done, all right? The way it would work for those of you under 40, after you shot 36 exposures, you'd put the film in this little round canister and you'd drive to the far corner of the neighborhood supermarket where there was a little yellow and white building called Photomat. You would drop your pictures off, wait a month and a half for them to come back, <laughs> half of them overexposed. Some of you go, man, this guy's preaching gospel truth. Yeah, that's how it was. We suffered for the kingdom back then. Well, the Polaroid camera fixed that because you would shoot the picture and you didn't have to wait a month and a half. It would spit it out. You'd shake it for two minutes and your picture, voila, emerged right in front of you. I want you to imagine today that we let church out early, we board a charter flight, we fly deep into the jungles of Mexico, and we're going to go on a safari. And you have a Polaroid camera, and you're at the front of the safari, and you just happen to snap a picture of a black jaguar leaping across the trail in front of us. You caught him midair. 
Now this is remarkable for two reasons. Number one, black jaguars are almost never filmed in the wild. You got one in the wild, but not only that, you got a dramatic pose. He's midair and you captured it. <coughs> Imagine further that while you're waiting for that picture to <coughs> develop, pardon me, <coughs> got over COVID five minutes ago. Oh, thank you, Pastor. I'm telling you, that air in Scotland was so cold when you drank tea, you saw things. It was unbelievable. I had visions, folks, but I'm still recovering. While you're waiting for that picture of the Jaguar that you captured to emerge, imagine I come up behind you, I take the camera out of your hands, I rip your picture out of it, and I tear it up. Are you going to be mad at me? Yeah, you'll kill me even if you say you're pro-life, right? <clears throat> What if I said to you, why are you angry at me? I didn't see a jaguar in that picture. All I saw was a square piece of paper with a square brown mark on it. You'd say, are you crazy, dude? The jaguar in the picture was already there. You just couldn't see him because he was still developing. Men and women, from the one cell stage, you were already there. We just couldn't see you because you were still developing. That's the science of embryology. But there's another reason why some people don't get this. They, they've reduced abortion to a matter of preference, like choosing chocolate ice cream over vanilla. And they think there's no moral truth to be known on the issue, only personal preferences. And they think the only reason we don't support abortion is because we dislike it. But morality is not about what we like or prefer. It's about right or wrong, regardless of preferences. For example, my father-in-law, who's 88, he drives Corvettes. He's a crazy dude. He, he skis at age 88. He also has surfing. He surfs. He rides horses. And uh, he is not going to die in his sleep. He is going to die at age 99, flying off a, a cliff somewhere on a pair of skis into the arms of Jesus. That's how he's going to go. And uh, I will be out in California in a couple of weeks. I know where the keys to his new Corvette are. He's going to be gone. I could take that car. What I'd like to do is take that car and go charging up PCH past Malibu, Pepperdine, and really enjoy opening that thing up. But I'm not going to do it even though I'd like to do it. Why? Because it would be wrong. Morality is not about preferences. It's about what's right and wrong regardless of likes and dislikes. So how do we reach people who think abortion is nothing more than what some like and others don't? Well, one of the ways we do it is to speak to their moral intuitions, to give them a chance to view what's actually at stake in this debate, in just a moment, I'm going to show you a tool that I show at high schools where I speak, Christian worldview forums and conferences. We use it in churches like this. And by the way, I just have to tell you, I have tremendous respect for you, Pastor Carl, that you're willing to take on tough issues like this. You are well led at this church. It's not always the case, churches were willing to take issues like this. So <laughs> salute you, sir. But... I'm going to show you this short video clip that's 55 seconds long. You do not need to watch it. Let me tell you exactly what's in it. You won't see an abortion performed, but you will see the aftermath. And I want to warn you, it's disturbing. It's gruesome to look at. Parents, if you're here with children under the age of seventh grade, would you, during the film, just put your arm around your child and encourage them to look down? Uh, for those of you that wish not to watch, we've made it easy for you to avoid the contents. We've taken the narration out of the clip. There's only instrumental music, so you won't even hear anything described you don't want to hear or see. Also, please hear me, men and women. This is crucial. I know I'm speaking to some people here today that for you, you've had personal experience with abortion, and I don't know if I'm talking to guys who encouraged women to abort or women who made that choice because you thought you had no other way out. Can I tell you just straight out, Pastor Carl, Carl is not here to condemn you. I'm not here to condemn you. And let me tell you why. We are grounded in the Christian gospel. And that Christian gospel says, men and women, that God created a good world with humans that were designed to enjoy him forever. But we rebelled against our maker. We decided we were going to call the shot. And God, who would have been perfectly just to wipe out the entire race, Think about that for a moment. If God saved no one, would he still be a just and fair God? Yes, because we'd be getting exactly what we deserve as rebels. But God didn't do that. He sent Jesus, who stood in our place condemned and bore in full the wrath of God's judgment against sin. 
Jesus on Calvary was not just an example of love. He was bearing God's judgment against rebels like you and me in our place. That's the gospel. He stands in our place condemned, as the old hymn writer writes. And that's what Jesus did for you. And then God raised him from the dead, proving that his sacrifice was sufficient for our sin. Can I speak to some of you today? If abortion is in your history, you don't need an excuse. You know what you need? What all of us here today need. In exchange, the righteousness of Christ for our sinfulness. Second, or 1 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus stood in our place, the great exchange of the gospel. That's good news. You are not made righteous because of things you do, because you continue to sin just like I continue to sin. Here's the thing about the gospel. You're not made righteous, you're declared righteous because of what Jesus did standing in your place as your legal representative. That's the gospel. So if that's you, I have very good news for you. You get welcomed into God's family, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did in your place. He kept God's law perfectly, absorbed the judgment of God you and I deserved, and that means you can be welcomed into God's family as dearly loved children. You don't have to feel like an outsider. Post-abortion men and women don't need to feel like outsiders. They need to feel like adopted into God's family as his dearly loved children. So as we view this film, let's keep the good news of the gospel in mind that we are accepted on the merits of Christ, not because of what we've done. Let's go ahead and we'll view that clip and then we'll continue. probably feel like I do looking at visuals of that nature and thinking, man, do we really need to show things like that to make our point? And I'm sympathetic if you feel that way. I don't like these pictures any more than you do, but I recognize the historical power of using images to convey truths the culture wants to ignore. In 1955, there was a historical event in this nation that has recently been put into a major motion picture. Uh, some of you may have seen this movie. It was called Till. And it's the story of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old African-American boy who in the summer of 1955 journeyed from, Money, or from Chicago where he lived to visit his cousin in the town of Money, Mississippi. And when he got down to Money, Mississippi, he began to brag to his cousin about having two white girlfriends back in Chicago. And the cousin and the friend said, no, you don't. We don't believe you. And he said, yeah, I do. And they said, okay, hotshot, we challenge you to talk to a white girl down here. And that afternoon... They all went into this tiny little store called Bryant's Grocery in downtown Money, Mississippi. And that 14-year-old African-American boy walked up to the counter and he looked at the clerk who was a 21-year-old white married woman and very innocently but flirtatiously as he purchased a piece of gum, he flashed her a smile and said, thanks, babe. We hear that today, we don't think anything of it. But back then, that was a big deal to speak to a white woman that way if you were black. Well, two nights later, that boy was taken at gunpoint by the woman's husband and another man, and they drove him outside Money, Mississippi. And after savagely beating him and breaking nearly every bone in his upper torso, they finally shot him and threw him in the river, threw his corpse in the river, where the sheriff discovered him, presumably three to four days later. The sheriff took what was left of Emmett, put him in a wooden box, not even a coffin, just a wooden box that he sealed shut with nails, and he nailed a note on there to Mamie Till, Emmett's mother, which read, don't open this, you won't like what you see. And when Mamie Till got the body, she shocked the world with an announcement. 
she said to the press that was gathered there, we're gonna have a public funeral for my son and it's going to be an open casket funeral. And the newspaper press was enraged with her. You can't do this, Mrs. Till. Do you realize the condition your boy is in? And if you Google the image of Emmett Till, you'll see what I mean. It's gruesome, be warned. She went ahead, stood her ground. And that picture of Emmett Till in that casket was published in Jet Magazine and it launched the civil rights movement in this country. And when Mamie Till was asked why she insisted on doing it, here's what she said. I want the whole world to see what they did to my boy. And that's why we had someone like Rosa Parks a few months later stand her ground when ordered to go to the back of the bus. She said, here's why I had courage. I could not get the picture of that boy out of my mind. Why do pro-life Christians show images like this? Not to condemn and beat up on people. We show them for one reason, men and women. If we don't lovingly but truthfully open the casket on abortion, our nation will continue to tolerate injustice it never needs to look at. But as Christians, as we open the truth of abortion, we also open the truth of God's word that sinners can be reconciled to their creator because God the Father has sent a substitute to stand in our place condemned and thus we can be declared right with him. We offer truth and we offer hope. That's the gospel. Second question we need to be clear on. <clears throat> We need to be clear on the question of what makes us valuable. In just a minute, I'm going to have you look around the room and stare at some people. If you came to church today and you, you happen to notice someone that looks rather attractive and you're single and you're thinking, boy, I would sure like to make eye contact with them, but you're not sure that would be a holy thing to do in church, this will be your God-sanctified moment to do it. Do not laugh. I met my wife that way, okay? So when I tell you, ladies, same thing, if you, not only young guys, but gals, if you want to look around, those of you that are married, I trust you know where to look, but um, if not, please see Pastor Carl. <clears throat> One, two, three, go ahead, stare at some people. Give them the eye, go ahead, look around the room, give them the eye, stare at them. All right, look back this way. <laughs> Pastor Carl is reaching out to Gloria saying, look this way. <laughs> Not because she had eyes elsewhere, but he, I think she was unclear where he was. Let's be clear about that. Um, Got to be careful here. Question, as you were staring at each other, what makes us equal? Our culture is obsessed with equality, is it not? It wants income equality, gender equality, and the list goes on and on. It wants income equality because it thinks everybody should be paid the same. But let me ask a question. What makes us valuable in the first place? Are we all physically equal in this room? No chance. At age 62, I cannot play basketball and win against most of the people that are, I'm looking at that are younger than me. I still have the three-point shot, but I'm too slow to get open for it at my age. But I'll beat you in horse where I don't have to be quick. But beyond that, I'm in trouble. But men and women, if Planned Parenthood is right that we can destroy a human fetus because it's not as developed as you and I, if development is what gives us value and you have more of it, you have a greater right to life than me and human equality is out the window. Are, all, are we all equally self-aware right now? How many of you had coffee, the real thing, not that satanic substitute called decaf? How many of you had coffee before coming to church? All right, your brain is probably firing on all cylinders right now, but if you had decaf, and then had a carb breakfast full of carbs, you're probably this side of comatose right now. Um, but here's the thing, if self-awareness gives us value and a right to life, if Peter Singer, the ethicist at Princeton is right, that we can kill a newborn and kill a fetus because neither is self-aware, and he's right, neither is. If self-awareness gives us our value and you have more of it than me, we don't have equality. You have a greater right to life than me because you have more of the trait that we've determined to be important. You know what the one thing is that we all share equal in this room? We all share the same human nature that bears the image of God according to the scripture we just read. Now that image of God does not come in degrees the way that self-awareness does. It does not come in degrees the way that physical development does. You get it from the moment you begin to exist. And we already looked at when we begin to exist, the moment of fertilization. That is the science of embryology. There are differences between you, the embryo, and you, the adult, but none of those differences are morally relevant. You are less developed as an embryo than you are today, but you need to ask this question. Why does that matter? Don't let critics just make assertions, challenge their assumptions. Why does being developed matter? Or they may say the embryo doesn't look human. 
Well, why does how I look determine? Look, you could look at a mannequin in the store and it may look very realistic, but it's not. While someone like the elephant man didn't look human, but was. You've got to ask the question, what is something? There's four differences between you, the embryo, and you, the adult. None of them are good reasons for saying we could kill you then, but not now. There's a difference of size, a difference of level of development, a difference of environment, meaning where you're located, and difference of degree of dependency. Think of the acronym SLED. You'll remember these four differences. Size, you were smaller as an embryo. You know what your answer should be? So, how big do I have to be not to be killed? Make your critic answer that question. Two-year-olds are smaller than 20-year-olds, but we don't think the two-year-old has less of a right to life. You were less developed. There's your L, SL, level of development. You were less developed as an embryo. So what? How developed do you have to be not to be killed? 14-year-old students are not as developed as 28-year-old adults, but we don't think the 14-year-olds have less of a right to life simply because they're less developed. Uh, if you believe that, you're going to have a hard time accounting for human equality. What about environment, where you're located? You were in the womb, now you're out. How does where you are determine what you are? If you drove at least 20 miles to come to church today, raise your hand. Look at this, Pastor. You've got people coming from all over. 30 miles. Okay, this is getting serious. 37 miles. 57 miles. 907 miles, I win. Now... <clears throat> If a journey of 37 miles doesn't change you from one kind of thing to another, how does a journey of seven inches down the birth canal suddenly transform you from non-human, non-valuable person we can kill to a valuable human being we can't kill? And the answer is, if you weren't already human and valuable, changing your address doesn't fix that. And finally, degree of dependency. You depended on your mother for survival, but since when does dependency on another human being mean that we can kill you? I live in the town of Noonan, Georgia. You've never heard of it. But it's where they film the wildly popular television series, The Walking Dead. And it's the primary filming spot. Now, I'm not, please understand me, I'm not saying go home tonight for family viewing night, crank up The Walking Dead. It is a zombie series and it is rather uh, graphic, to put it mildly. But the hero of the series is, and by the way, it's not a satanic show, it's a virus that's causing zombies, not devils, okay, just so you know. But the hero of the show for most of the series was a sheriff by the name of Rick Grimes. And in season one, episode one, Rick Grimes is a policeman and he's out on a, a call where he and his partner get into a gunfight with bad guys. And Rick gets hit and he's in a hospital for a month with a coma. And while he's in that coma, the zombie apocalypse breaks out. And, wait, and Rick wakes up and he's all alone. There's no one with him. And he has to figure out what happened to my wife, what happened to my son, where's the world I once know, know or once knew. That's season one of The Walking Dead summarized for you. Change the script though. Suppose one doctor had stayed behind to care for Rick and Rick depends totally on him for that month. Would it be okay for that doctor to kill Rick because Rick depends totally on him for survival? Size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency, none of those are good reasons for saying we could kill you then but not now. So what does this all mean? What's our duty? And that's our final question this morning. Our duty is simply this, men and women, to love our unborn neighbor. And that is costly. These roses you see up here, these 62 roses, every one of those babies saved was costly to save. It can't be done on the cheap. And yet, if you look at the ministry of For Her and what Audra and her team are doing, they are sacrificially giving to save these children and they need us to stand with them because it's not easy to do. It's expensive to save children. But love biblically understood is always costly. The Good Samaritan didn't just feel pity for the beating victim, he took pity for the beating victim. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Schindler's List, but there's a scene in there that exemplifies biblical love perfectly. Oscar Schindler is a man who in World War II used his own money to buy death camp victims off the death list and he would go to the Nazi commanders and say, don't kill these people. Let me give you money in exchange for them and they can come work for me. And over 1,100 people were saved because of what Oscar did. But there's a scene near the end of the movie that will just bring you to tears. Oscar Schindler is saying goodbye at the end of the war to all the people he saved. And he's about to get in his car and drive off. And the leader of the Jewish people takes his hand to thank him and Oscar says, you know, I, I didn't do enough. I could have got more out and I didn't do it. 
And he looks at his car that he's about to be whisked away and he says, my car, why did I keep my car? I could have sold it and got 10 more people, but I didn't do it. I could have done more and I didn't. He then looks at his jacket. He's got a decorative pen. He rips it off and says, why did I keep this pen? They would have given me two more people for this and I didn't do it. Two more people they would have given me. And the scene ends with him weeping profusely on his knees behind his car saying, I didn't do enough. I could have got more out and didn't. And this from a man, men and women, who used his own resources to buy people off the death camp list. And the question I want us to think about as we think about moving toward a time where we can love our, our unborn neighbor and his mother through the ministry of for, her, for her, the question I want us to just ponder is this. Are we taking our Holocaust in 2023 as seriously as Oscar Schindler took his in the 1940s? And if so, are we willing to not only feel bad abortion, about abortion, but act like we feel bad? I'm going to ask you this morning to do two things. In a moment, if you don't already have it, by the way, go ahead and secure this pamphlet and the envelope that came with it. If you'd go ahead and secure that, I'm going to ask us to do two things together. I'm going to ask you, number one, to take this envelope and make a donation to For Her this morning. The money that you give will go toward the vision you heard Audra talk about, the vision that represents these 62 lives in front of us. And I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to give a gift today that is truly sacrificial, the kind of gift where when you wake up from your afternoon nap today, you look at your spouse and say, honey, we gave what today in church? Why would I ask you to do that? For what does these roses represent? The vision of saving children. But I'm also going to ask you to do one more thing. And you can do that by scanning the QR code here or making your check payable to for her. I'm going to ask you to commit to a monthly amount. Why would I do that? Because some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, the dude just asked us to drain our bank accounts and now he wants a monthly amount? Yeah, here's why. The big sacrificial gift you give this morning for, for her goes toward the vision of these roses, saving children. Your monthly donation keeps the lights on, pays all the expenses, and both are vitally important. So in the moment in front of us right now, would you take this envelope and either through check or credit card or scanning that QR code, would you give lavishly to the ministry of For Her and the work that Audra is doing? And together, let's step up and love our unborn neighbor by giving sacrificially and being able to defend him as well. Do that with me. God bless you as together we stand and engage on this issue.